everybody. Good afternoon. Yeah, I changed it up a little bit. It's a beautiful Tuesday. It is the 20th of February, 2024, and this is 88.7 FM WGVE. Welcome to another episode of the Pop-Up Podcast, Hashtag That Afternoon Show, an opportunity and privilege I get to talk with the Brain Trust, a lot of members of the Gary Community School Corporation, staff, teachers, administrators, partners, people that are working with the wonderful district, doing just a lot of great things. And every once in a while, they'll slip me a student, and I get to hang out with them. So it's pretty cool stuff. If you want to know what's going on in the district and just have good conversations about education, this is the place to be. I always tell folks that, and so we hope that you enjoy it. Today's going to be no different. We've got our a guest who is a frequent guest on our show. Whenever she's not as busy as she's doing running the district, uh, and every time we uh, have her on, we always appreciate her personality, her candor, and just her ability to just kind of flow with the show. So with that, we're going to toss it over to, uh, I will say good morning, that is. Good afternoon. I'm all discombobulated. To Dr. Esther Good, who is uh, chief of schools. Am I getting it right this time? You are right. Yeah. Now, yeah. I have some people who call me the mother of schools. Well, there you go. And listen, the caregiver of schools, the right. nurturer of schools, whatever we want to call you. That's yeah. right. We know mamas do it all, right? <laughs> well, anyway, Dr. Good's good to see you. How have things been going so far? It's, it's going great. You yeah. know, it's going. This is that time of the year that feels very long. Right. Like, where everybody is gasping for air yeah. and looking for a break. And um, when spring break is not quite on our radar in this moment, you know, teachers are tired. Yeah. Students are yeah. tired. Yeah. It's, it's a job that... Um, keeps you going. Yeah, I can imagine. And you you get worn down. You give of yourself every day. So absolutely, our absolutely. Our teachers get worn down, and our um, students are you know antsy. They want the weather to break. They're oh my tired god! Yeah, cold weather. Absolutely. I mean, I remember. I I think I said it on this show before, but I remember during this time of year, even when I was in college, he used to call me and kind of put this in my ear. But my dad always used to just talk about this time of the year. He was a principal. But this is an opportunity that he would really get ginned up about is because this is, if you're a scholar, it's still not too late. This little little stretch of February, it might look like a short month, but you can actually hold, serve, and gain. Maybe you'll even gain a little ground in order to you know meet your goal by the end of the year. Because once you get that spring break under the belt, I mean, teachers come back. They're ready to start testing. It's very hard to kind of go back. But this nice little stretch when you first get back and then the month of February is a nice little place to gain some ground. It is. Yeah, yeah. Is. So uh, I know we're going to talk some black history uh, in just a bit, uh, little bit, but kind of give us some uh, some of your thoughts on how the district's going right now. Because, you know, in addition to what we were just talking about, I mean, you know, for students, this is, uh, you know, we're in the home stretch now. It seems crazy. Like we were just talking about getting the schools open and we're already at February 20th. We're, we're going to be graduating kids in just a little bit, and then kids are going to be moving on to their next grades. Yeah. What's the what's it looking like? I mean, what are you what are you feeling like? First of all, you just spoke about it. What's the morale with the staff, the teachers? So I, I'm sure that while they are very hopeful, yeah, they are just starting to be a little you know, <laughs> worn on. Yeah, yeah. That yeah. that that whole um, the self care is real. Yeah, it is. We have schools who are practicing self care. Right. Administrators see it in their teachers and they want to um, dig in and help. Absolutely. So they are, like I specifically know that Beverage has a self-care campaign. Nice. Group and has, it's a nine-week process, but they are trying to fill the buckets yeah. of their teachers so that they in turn can fill the buckets of their students. Right, right. So we know, we always know happiness is a trickle-down It is. Effect. It is. And so when <coughs> they're happy at the top, then they become happier in the middle right. and happier where we get to our students. So, yeah, uh, We want to be able to always share some, some joy and some inspiration and build that culture of positivity, but also that nurturing culture, the one that says, we love you, we got you, right, and um, we got each other's back. So that's what's real. We're we're in a place where there's lots of activities going on. Oh my goodness! Yes. <laughs> it's something almost every day. Oh my goodness! I was looking at my calendar and I was thinking, Oh my goodness! M G. Yeah, really yeah. Good. Every day there's something um, going on from last week to this week to next week. Yeah. Um, and it's not all just about Black History, but it but it is a great time to teach. Yeah. Our rich history. Right. To talk about. The city of Gary, right? Um, what it means to so many people, or what it has been to so many people. You know, we grew up here. Yeah. 
Um, but everybody did not. Right. And when I look at our staff and our student makeup, everyone may not know what we know mm -hmm. about the city, about the school district, right. Right. you know, about evolving from William A. Word. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who don't know. Oh, I know there is. I, I know. And, and how can you, you know. And how can they walk up right and live exactly. with themselves? Absolutely. In this day and time, <laughs> it is it is our legacy. It's our history. Yeah. And so just getting everybody to know from where we've come. Yeah. It's, it's, it's hard to have pride when you don't know where you've been. It's hard to know where you're going. It's hard. It's hard. So that's where we are in yeah. the district right now. We are celebrating so much. Um getting our students to like you, you may have seen where um williams over at dr daniel hill williams school right dr mcgee dr michael mcgee came in right. and he brought in some members of his fraternity mm -hmm. got the alpha side the fraternity, yeah. correct and they talked about being doctors right Listen. and reading to students yeah and, and had on his lab coat right for our presentation because kids don't know right who Dr. Daniel Hill Williams. Oh, my was. goodness, right. And so just getting them that information. You go to the school every day. Why is this man so important? Right. Why did they name a school after right. him? Right, right. You know, it, one day maybe a school will be named after you. No, I like that. I like that approach. I mean, you know, I was talking to somebody, and we've been doing this for about a couple of weeks now. We had our good friend. State Representative Earl Harris Jr. spent a day with me uh, a couple of Fridays. He was beginning of the show, he stayed the entire show, and we just talked about a lot of things as it relates to education because he sits on a committee. And we were talking about one of the subjects that's really been resonating on the show, and he and I saw differently on this, but as I said, we agreed about it. I mean, we agreed that this is something that we should be talking about, and that is a piece of legislation that is performed down, that is downstate, that kind of speaks to the retention of third graders and having to move on if they're not proficient. Now, I I appreciate he and Dr. Smith and those guys are professionals. My peers were educators, and so I understand what they were saying about it. But I was in the you know what we've been having conversations on this show, and I want you to kind of just give me a, a nice little way in is about you know kind of underestimating our students. And you know I, I you know I guess I consider myself privileged. I really do is because I when I went to the Garrett Community School Corporation. We didn't really sit around. The, the expectations were just absolutely off the chart. Uh, they were high, and that was cool. That was part of the playing field. You get what I mean? Now I understand there's a, a whole new model out here about the way people look at students, the way we look at education. But I want to ask you, because you're a professional, I've been waiting to ask somebody who's a little smarter than me in this. You know, I mean, <laughs> without getting into the politics of it, but just okay. talk to me about modernly dealing with the student. Because... It does appear from the outside looking in is that we sent, we tend to now look at what students can't do or really celebrate their deficiencies a little too early rather than going out here and challenging a student. Real quick, I'll just give you my scenario when it comes down to this third grade thing. And okay. I was trying to make it, uh, trying to explain my perspective. And that is, is that I look at education as a kind of a total package of the big picture. And so in, a, in the environment of education, when a parent, Parents or parents, whatever the dynamic, that's irrelevant at this point. But when the guardian of a scholar has a child, mm -hmm. they're going to introduce that child into the education system somewhere around three or four, whether you go to pre-K and at the bare minimum, mm -hmm. fifth grade. Now, with this information out here and obviously with these new testing standards that the governments are starting to send down, as a parent, you kind of know that your child is going to be tested on reading our proficiency level by the time they finish the third grade. You literally got about four or five years to kind of work on that. This is where I come in. I want to get your thoughts. I've just I've seen it behind the scenes with my parents. I see it with my wife. I watch it when I'm observing people like yourself. And that is is that from kindy from pre-K teachers to kindergarten teachers to first grade teachers, second, third, you all make yourselves available. There are opportunities. You know, maybe your child has a learning or disability, but in kindergarten, when the teacher makes time aside for you to come in and talk about your kid, you can find that out early. You can find those things out early. If your child's falling behind, there are resources you can use during this period of time. You don't have to wait till you get to third grade and deal with that problem. And so it's not a one-off deal. Now, one of the other things I said, and, you know, I'm, I'm just, that education is an ascending type of thing. 
Listen, I mean, I, I can appreciate children that, that, that are being challenged by it. And, you know, I'm not saying that I wasn't, but third grade is easy. It really is compared to the rest of the education. I mean, if you, at the bare minimum, get your reading done so you can move on to understanding themes, comprehension, and all the other things that are going to be required for your child to build upon that. And so when you have people that use the argument that, well, you know, the child's feelings are going to get hurt if they're missing their cohort or other kids move on, Number one, I don't assume that there's going to be a lot of children that get to that point if, you, if parents get involved at the right time. You can save kids, teach you all are professionals. What I would also say is that I'm less worried about the, ninth, the nine-year-old child in third grade than I am about the 15 or 14-year-old who is afraid to raise his hand in class because he or she does not want to be humiliated and is going to start acting out and kind of messing up and eventually possibly drop out. I'm not worried about a kid who's nine years old, who in a minute is probably going to have a whole new set of friends that he's going to make, feel more confident about his or herself going forward because now they're up and they're being able to answer questions and that confidence builds. And I've met, I, you know, I always use an example. I know somebody that's very smart, that's living a great life now, and is earning a lot of money as a corporate attorney who was held back at, 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 in elementary school because he was not able to kind of just pass what we have as standards. I just want to get your thoughts as teacher. I don't want you to weigh in if you you know about that specific legislation, but just talk about how you all as professionals are always making yourselves available for parents to come in and find out what's going on with their kids. Oh, so loaded. You That's a loaded question. Yeah. Loaded. It but, is loaded. But, so I look at it twofold yeah. as a parent and as a teacher. Okay, there you go. So um, I, I have to first say hats off to parents who are able to um, instill that skill set in their students prior to them coming right. to school. Period. And I think that's probably what was prevalent when you and I were in right. school. Um, parents are the first educators. They are. Um, they learn a lot at home. Yes. And then they come to school and yes, K-1, 2, and 3, we are teaching students to learn to read. Yes. And that comes with it so much responsibility on the teacher and the school, the student, yeah. to be able to um, come away with a sense of fluency, comprehension, and um, being able to really, really, really demonstrate that they understand what's going on. Yes. But also on the parent side, um, I think about when my young man was a child and everybody around him wanted him to read. Right. And wanted to hear him read. Right. So it wasn't just my job as mom. Grandma stepped in. Dad Thank stepped you. in. Auntie stepped in. Everybody came with a book. I have young nephews now and I'm constantly sending books. Thank you. And I'm saying we get online on Zoom and FaceTime and I have them read. Right. So what it is is it's a culture shift in that we used to do we used to read just as a regular pastime. You think about you read the newspaper. Oh, absolutely. That's that was the exercise you talked about. My dad on Saturdays, two minutes of his time was reading the headlines. You yeah. know, before I went, when I was about three or two years old. Yeah. And it's kind of like the conversation I just had about typing. But, so we, we made a conscious effort. Right. At the younger years to cultivate readers. Yes. Now, some assumptions have seem to have taken place that we no longer need to do that. But we Who's do. making those assumptions? I, now, that's the part I don't know. I can't quite. <laughs> no, no, I'm just talking in general. on that one. But I do think that some folks assume that. Like they just come into the world typing because they're digitally um, astute. Right. They come into the world reading. Yeah. And, and so it, it, it takes for us all to work together. Right. It's got to be a village. The village shouldn't have gone away. It's no longer um, that village that's sitting prevalently in that child's life wanting to, everybody wants to hear you read. Right. And so if we can get back to, I, you know, when I'm in schools, I'm, often ask the folks in the office, the kids, why are you here? 
Then I get into ISS and I start asking folks, read, tell me what's going on. Yeah. After I find out why you're here, then I, I need to know where we're reading it. Right. Because a lot of that is our problem. Mm -hmm. We're acting out because we're not able to maybe keep up in the classroom. That, thank so you. I believe that. I don't want that to be our burden, our hindrance, or our barrier to being educated. So we are working um, more intentionally yes. at the K-3 to level yeah. or pre-K-3 to level so that our students are readers. We're, we're, we opted in to test them at second grade because we want to know early on. Mm -hmm. um, we also get benchmark exams. I ready. See, you know, K-3, there's, it's no secret. I had a staff member who works in our district, right. you know, come in and talk to me about her own child's reading score. Right, right. right. We're looking at it and she's off the charts now. Mm -hmm. But, but that was mom partnering with school. Right. Yeah. To make it happen. So, it doesn't, I want parents to know it doesn't have to be us reaching out. It can be you reaching out as well. We're there though. Our hands are open. We are willing to try to do whatever we can. And sometimes the parent does know better than us. Of course. What is going to make their child incentivized? Tell us. No, I like We're okay with tell us. Thank you, Esther, for, for kind of answering that because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I think back to, um, uh, Janae and her mom who had the parenting institute. And I remember all these years yep. ago, I would, you know, I remember when I first, uh, met them about a decade, 10, 15 years ago. And they, and, and mm -hmm. I remember they had the parenting institute. And I was like, the parenting institute? I mean, what's that all about? You mean, you, you got a, you got a little some resource to help teach, uh, people how to be parents. And of course she said, her mother said, absolutely. And so, you know, as you just kind of eloquently went down this thing, is it time that we just say, you know what, let's reintroduce education and what it looks like to parents. Let's do it formally. I know that you all have never left, but going back to the point of what we were talking about earlier, I just think that there has been a point, I don't know when it happened, but we definitely saw it exacerbated and amplified during COVID. But, you know, when you talk about how we came up, there was a symbiotic relationship between parents and the schools. I mean, yeah. you know, listen, even if you were a kid and you were misbehaving and, or you thought a teacher had it in for you and I've had a lot of friends do it and you know I had to. Yeah. My, the parents always said, you know what, I, I'll talk to you when you get home. That's you right. always believe the teacher and, you, you know, you defend your kid and things like that. But there was just a working relationship. And it seemed that at, at some point, I don't know whether politics got involved or how it happened, but it just seemed like there was fractured and it became, you know, not only was it separated, it became somewhat adversarial. And so, you know, you have teachers obviously trying to protect their rounds. You got parents that, you know, my child can do no wrong. I don't want to hear anything from you. And the person that's sitting in the middle catching the crossfire is the scholar because yeah. they don't get the benefit of you all as professionals. And, of course, they have appearance now a little antagonistic towards the, the, the schools that they attend. And, and, and I want parents to know that we're their friends. Yes. But we are not, we, we understand it does not benefit us. You're not the bad guy. out of school. Right. We, we want them there. We want kids in school. We want them learning. We want to cooperate with the home. Right. We know that at the end of the day, we really are wanting the same goals we have the same goals for our students we don't want any child to walk away not getting what they need right so but we also understand that maybe this placement isn't appropriate for every child right so we do want to make sure that we are appropriately placing every student that comes through our door right but reading that is you know that is something that our ancestors fought. I, I did a whole thing this we morning about, about that. Black history. It was a capital That's punishment. Black history, right? So, so it is incumbent upon us yes. to do our part at the schoolhouse, right? But need parents to understand that we want to partner with them. Mm -hmm. Where you you hear us with events like War to Read? Yeah, it's because we want to show ourselves outside of the classroom as readers as well. Yeah. We want students to come and find some passion mm -hmm. in the books that we are providing so that we can read together. Absolutely. I get an opportunity in those, at those events 
to just sit down and listen to our students read. Thank you. And, and what's amazing is so many of them can, and yeah. it's just not translating to where I needed to get to. So, so for me, that's the, it keeps me up at night. Right. You hear um, the Divine Nine has been coming in right. to our classrooms on the Friday. sororities and the fraternities. Sororities and fraternities. The African American sororities and right. fraternities. Right. Because they understand that they're pouring into their future. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're based on service to mankind and scholarship mm -hmm. and, and sisterhood or brotherhood. And so they are forming bonds with our students because they want to be a part of that village. Yeah. I have some, um, some of my sororers have been to every school. It's like they're going on a tour. God bless them. I see them. On Friday afternoons. And I thank them for their time. Yeah. Because they're going out of their way to read to our students. Now you and mean the skiwis? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> the ladies of the owl, forgot the owl, the sorority. No, I just was giving them exactly. Go ahead. But, 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 but what I want to say is that um, that has opened the doors for so many people to give back mm -hmm. and come in and see our needs. Right. Um, to, to assist. Like like I was with the Dazzling Divas of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. On Saturday, oh. they are giving. Um, so you're kind of uh, you know playing around in the you know the other side once a Well, okay, you're so a very you're a diplomat. You're, you're we have different to do that. colors, yeah. but we have the same goal, okay. and all right. we all love each other. Oh. We do, oh. even though we say we don't. We okay, do. I was about to say, this is a far cry from some of the situations I've seen myself in. We love each other. Okay. We love each All other. Right. And we're all willing to come together for a common goal. For a common goal, and that's the kids. Yep, the kids. Absolutely. So, so I think about the president of D9 was here one cold day, and I said, hey, I need y'all to come in and read to our students. Because, again, it might they don't necessarily need to see me all the time, but they need to see who they can be. Right. They they need to have some goals and aspirations that may not, ins I might not inspire that, but they may Why be not? inspired by somebody else. Now, let me ask I'm you. I'm giving them all the options. No, I like, I, you know, I, I appreciate your humbleness, but, you know, I I would be inspired uh, by you. I think we, we've come leaps and bounds, and I'm glad you brought up uh, about reading as far as it relates to black history, because this we were talking education today on the morning show, and, you know, I kind of went down this road, and, I was trying to emphasize to parents as somebody who looks in from the outside that, I, you know, period, point blank, I don't care what race, color, creed you are, in mankind's history, we've never had it, uh, the, the great equalizer that we have now. And that is, is most people have a phone in their hands. Okay, let's just be honest. That connects you to knowledge. Knowledge was the great divider. It was. I mean, you've had wars that were, start, were started in order to keep people from having knowledge. And we, I brought it a little bit closer to home as far as black history. It used to be a capital offense if you were even caught teaching a slave to go out here and, and learn how to read. And there were a number of reasons. You would have people out. I mean, you think about the ratio of slaves per, per plantation owner. He might have had a foreman and things like that. But the numbers were absolutely in the favor of the slaves. And so you had to keep them... At, you know, at bay. Obviously, you try to make some examples of people who got violent, but you wanted to keep them ignorant. We are so past that now, and so that's why I'm. It's it's just great to hear about you know some of the ideas because I want to know what it looks like for these young kids going forward. They have to know how great they have it. They have to know how easy it is. I mean, you and I even, and I'm and I don't consider myself that old dude, but you know, to be honest with you. When you wanted to go out here and get some information, you had to get a ride to the library. To the library. You, 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 you had to be very deliberate about it. You sure as heck couldn't sit at home on the couch while you're eating your cereal and then say, "Hey, I want to know more about. Uh, I want to know more about an organism. What's that? Let me go get my phone." They don't have any excuses. And so, how do you go out here and just let them know that they just really have the world at their as their oyster, and they can, they should take care of it? I'll tell you what. I was talking to a group of kids. I want you to weigh in. Okay. I was letting, and, and, and I was thinking about a lot of the smart people. You all are in that category. I'm pointing to Chelsea, too, who, who's over in the, in the studio. Hey. But I, when I was growing up, there used to be something that used to be celebrated in the Garrett Community Schools. Now, I, I went to school and everything was open. And that was promotion and double promotion. Oh, my freaking goodness. Listen, I, I, I've got one of my best friends. He's graduated behind me because he got promoted uh, you know, while well, he was at VOR, and that's a whole other story about VOR. But anyway, 
there used to be these bastions of schools. Banneker kind of was like the crown school where everybody who thought they were smart went. We were out there in Miller. You had, um, you, once again, you had board. There were pretty much schools all over the place. But what I'm suggesting and what I'm saying is, is that there was a lot of that, I mean, a lot of that academic prowess was being promoted just as much as a athletic prowess. I mean, for real. I mean, it, it, it was a very big deal. We don't really hear that anymore. Instead, I hear more emphasis on the, the behind the scenes or, or, or the other side of the coin where we're worried about students not getting left behind and, and those kind of conversations. And I'm just, I'm still a guy that wants to believe in these kids because I don't think there's anything different than we were. I just think they just probably need to be stimulated. And once again, I kind of, I put that out there because I want the community, I want parents to understand about just the resources and opportunities they had. So to my point, Nowadays, if you are a scholar and you're playing your cards right, mm -hmm. do you understand you literally could pretty much wrap things up by the time you're a junior? Mm -hmm. You can go out here and grab you an associate degree while still in high school mm -hmm. and just for good measure in the Gary Community School Corporation, go grab you a certificate from the Gary Career Center and get yourself a job while you decide if you want to go to college or something. Or maybe pay your way and have a job while you're in college. You they have it made, Esther. They do, <laughs> and it would be much cheaper to do it yeah. on the high school side yeah. than on the college side. Yes. Um, they save somebody a lot of money <laughs> because dual credit courses and, you know, AP courses are cheaper for yeah. students that are in the high schools. Um, they do have it made. I go. Back, I think back to, um, grew up at Glen, Glen Park, and I visited Kennedy Branch Library. Oh, yeah. Often. Now, now. <laughs> Scheduling library in with cheerleading. Absolutely. Honor Society, mm -hmm. um, student council, oh. speech and debate. Oh, so you were her. That's right. You were that girl. Mm -hmm. All of those things came into play with, okay, now I got it. Mom, I got to get to the library. Right. It, it closes at night, so I got to get there by, you know, yeah. 730 yeah. so I yeah. can really find what it is that I'm looking for. Because you got to go to the car catalog. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 and wait, don't walk into the library and not know how to find what you're looking for. Thank That's you. a whole nother course. Yeah, they don't even know we had to take those courses. Dewey Decimal System and Material Center and all that kind of stuff. So go ahead, Esther. So, yes. so I just think about how they don't have that barrier. No. there's not. A, it's not about getting a ride to the library anymore. It is about they have so much access at their fingertips. Right. Um. And, and that is why instruction has changed yeah. because we've gotten to a point where we don't just want to say Google the answer. Well, of course not. Because it's Googleable. Right. right. So now we're, we're asking them to think. Show your work, we're basically. We're asking them to, yes, go back into maybe something that they've read that might not have been uh, capturing their their curiosity at the time, right. but at the same time, go back and cite that text. Right. We're asking them multiple phases of uh, problem solving. Yeah. If this happened, then then what happens here? Then what happens there? Which means I had to get the first set of questions correct. Exactly. So the, everything is layered Logic. now. Yeah. Correct. Because they don't just want folks Googling in order to demonstrate that they're learning. Right. They're thinking is the thing behind the learning now. And technology's not helping with the, the movement of AI and just oh, how fast God. it's moving. I mean, oh my God. I mean, I think I've been reading and listening to what you all educators, yeah. how you're doing your best to try to stay ahead of curb college professors and chairs of, uh, you know, they're, they're absolutely out there on the front lines trying to learn. High school teachers. I mean, you, you, you do have to go out here and stay on top of that. So you don't get caught up in not understanding the child's language. Because, unfortunately, AI can't replicate a child's language if you know that child and what they've been writing. So I, I think that's that correct. I think that's a, a major asset. But, listen, I just love this conversation that we've been having because I, I just love to be able to pull back the curtains and talk to the professionals like yourself and, and, and find out, like, how we go out here and really let these kids know about the true opportunities they have because, you know, it goes back to our initial point that I want to move on to black history, and that is, is that, you know, one of the things I found out in my very, in my life, and that is, and, and, and my, you know, I'm hearing my mom and Marguerite Smith in my head, the, my teacher, but it's the truth, and it got me out of a lot of tight situations, even when I got to college, when I was a science major, veterinary, all this, and that is, is that once you learn not only to read, but you can comprehend, 
you can find yourself out of a lot of tight spots. That's why I figure, you know, that that is essential that you knock down. You know, and and, and you want to get that done before you let, let a kid go any farther. You want to make sure they're understanding what it is they're reading because that, in fact, will help them go whatever path they want, whether they're going down the math path, where they want to go into computers, where they want to go into any other stuff. If they understand what's in that book or, or tablet in front of them, then they've already won half the battle. Yeah. I agree, and, and especially in mathematics, everybody, um, and I, you know, I'm a math major. You're a math person. But you do need to understand what's being asked of you. Yeah. And so oftentimes, um, people sit down and they see numbers and they start to manipulate numbers without knowing which direction they're going. Yeah. So I do want to talk, though, about writing. Please. A little bit. Because, you know, just just with reading. Yeah. We should be able to write. That's communication. Now, that's where you're challenged. These kids, are, you know, they live in a text world. They abbreviate yeah. everything. They speak like they text. It's My head explodes, but please. And, you know, now that they have AI, I just feel like run it through there if that's what you need to do. Um, run it through there. I mean, because in a tizzy, in a quick, tight spot, I may say what I need to say right. in the in the AI and say, okay, now I need to see it. Quick paragraph. Right. What kind of mom are you with that? Because my mom was not having it. I mean, if, if I lived, if, if I, there was more of a world, like if I was growing up in this time, I mean, my mom would have just absolutely, her head would have exploded because I used to walk around the house and even when my friends came over, God forbid we say the word ain't. Ain't ain't in the dictionary. And, and, and she was a walking around, she's a walking around the, the swords. It used to get, drive me nuts. Well, I'm probably bad <laughs> because, like, my son will text me, and I know it's this text language, and I'm like, did you mean to say? And then I write out this, 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 this grammatically correct sentence, and he's like, yeah, but, Mom, I was in a hurry, and I was just trying to, you know, get it out, and I'm like, yes, but um, I just needed to make sense because I need to know that when you are away from me talking to other people, there you go. that this does not sound like it looks in this text message. <laughs> so he's like, okay, over the top, mom. So I'm going to tell you, I'm probably bad. And yeah. my husband is equally as bad. Right. Because if you miss a word, he is like, uh, a sad nerd. Right. He's like correcting him. Like, God bless uh, him. I, I know he missed this word, right? Yeah. And, we're like, and he's like, Man, it's, it's rough in my house. Yeah, there you go. Trust me, your son thanks you for it in the end. He doesn't. He's, he doesn't tell you right now, but he thanks you for it. He does every now and then. Yeah. I get the thank y'all for raising me. Yes, like this. there Rocky you go. In college, and I, I, I'm like, wow. Yeah, because he looks around sometimes. Be like, you know what? There's some kids that did not have my benefits, and so thank you, mom and dad. Yes, he didn't have over over the top mom. So, <laughs> so, so I'll tell you in the in that vein of writing. Yes. Our new mayor yeah. has challenged our students mm -hmm. to an essay writing contest. Okay. Okay. So we are celebrating Black History, mm -hmm. and our students read "I Shook Up the World" mm. by Muhammad by, Ali. By Mariam Ali, no. his eldest daughter. Okay. Okay. So she's an author, a social worker, and an advocate for African American history. So okay. Who better to highlight, you know, during this? Great month, and Mariam will be here. Mm -hmm. They call her May May, so May May, May will yeah. be here on Thursday. Right. Um, our students in grades K to five were challenged with writing, mm -hmm. and the prompts were: "I, um, how has the story of Muhammad Ali inspired you yeah. to make a positive impact in your community?" <laughs> Or they could choose: "How do you think the actions of Muhammad Ali have made a positive impact on the world?" Mm -hmm. Okay, so. KM1, we're still working on those fundamental foundational right, writing pieces. Right. So we are not going to um, ha have them battle it out. Right. Second through fifth grade mm. at each school chose their best essay. Okay. Yeah. Out of the student body. Though. Out of the student body. Okay. Um, it was a non-negotiable, so they all wrote. Okay, right. And... Those essays. And this was been, peer reviewed. They choose. They chose themselves. It was, it, actually, it was no. It was not peer reviewed. It was adult reviewed. Okay. 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 Um, principals had to put their best foot forward, so they're putting it up against each other. Though. Right. So they wrote. So they sent an essay from each grade level to my office. Yeah. There's a committee who's looking at those essays right now. And I secret committee. Secret committee. I won't give them up. Yeah. 
Um, and they will then, so they will choose a second, a third, a fourth, and a fifth grader to be the official winner. Right. And those folks will win a um, check, oh. a, a, a monetary donation from Guy and Alan, mm -hmm. funeral home. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go back to second, third, fourth, fifth grade will each receive something special yeah. um, from Miss Ali. She has a presentation to give. Okay. So each school's school will send their four students over to City Hall mm -hmm. on Thursday. On Thursday. They'll get a chance to meet with um, Mr. and Mrs. Melton. Right. They'll get a chance to meet Ms. Ali. Mm -hmm. And they will get a chance to meet each other mm -hmm. and see who's doing all this creative writing in our school district. So it is important that our students are able to communicate effectively. Right. And this gives them an opportunity to know that at a young age, we are celebrating them for not only their communication skills, but their um, perspective okay, yeah. on how to shake up the world. Now, you know what? Muhammad Ali is a great character uh, to introduce because I can go back to even in first grade. I mean, when we when we were in elementary, we used to you have to dress up and it was a whole thing uh, all the way up through through fifth grade, really. Uh, but Muhammad Ali is such a layered character that the older you get, there's more levels you can go. You can get yes. into his social change and things like that. At the very beginning, of course, you can just talk about his background and what, how, just how great of an athlete he was and things like that. Then you can start to, as the scholars get a little bit more mature, you can go into different levels. So I yes. think that he's a, a perfect person uh, to, for you to use as the intersection of black history because it's very easy to understand. He's very tangible. He's a recent... Uh, character where a lot of people can kind of go and, and, and feel and touch him and their parents definitely know who he is. So that's a pretty good idea. And now I've got to ask the all important question because I might be representing some of these students involved. How much is the cash? Oh, I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go out here, you know, listen, get my agent cut. I'm out here after we get off of this show, I'm going to go find these kids and I'm going to let them know I'm their best yeah. representative. That you want to cut. <laughs> I want to be their agent. I, I, no, I but it's really a, hope I get a chance to talk to them and say, don't even, don't give, <laughs> don't go with percentages, okay? <laughs> no, but that's absolutely cool. So good stuff right so, there. Good so stuff yeah. right there. Uh, one of the things I don't, you know, I was kind of talking about it before you came on. I just read the ad and, uh, you know, I, I just was meeting with them a little earlier, but there's a student Black Knowledge Bowl coming up Saturday in which I'm the host, and I was up there in the office at the Career Center a little earlier, and I was talking to Selena, you know, mm -hmm. who works over at the Career Center, and um, she was talking about she's probably going to bring her daughter, but she was letting me know that the person that is the coach for the West Side team has really been putting in some work, mm -hmm. and so, you know, as we kind of get down the home stretch, I like a little trash talking, but I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so glad to hear this because... You know, I want I wanted to know what was going on, but I felt that maybe if I start to interfere a little bit too much, people think I'm trying to throw the thing. But mm -hmm. I want to talk to you, and I want mm -hmm. you to tell me exactly what that West Side team's looking like. Mm -hmm. I can't. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you. Don't give me the specific details. I the will, other I schools are listening. Specifics. Yeah. Because my team <laughs> is bringing the roar. Look at her. She's their paws are up. Paws are up. That paws are up. <laughs> Um, I will tell you that there's going to be some heavy competition in district, you know, yeah, yeah. because you got to be up for the task. Right, I agree. So, so we got to put our label on them, our seal the deal. Are you going to speak to them? Because, listen, you just got through saying, and you were a member, I don't know if they had the academic Super Bowl, but you were on the debate team. You know yeah, what all this stuff's like. So are you going to give them a nice little pep talk about what this means? Oh, I have talked to my students Okay, all, all right. right. Yeah. I ran into them this morning, <laughs> and they were asking, do you want to compete? Uh -huh. Do you want to compete? Uh -huh. I, and so I'm just trying to figure out do I, if I have time in the day to step up to the challenge. Right. Because I want, you know, you want the best. Absolutely. you got to be able to beat the best. Yes. So, so that means you got to beat me. Right. Oh. So, we, so you we have got a contract. See, I like, listen, I, I, let me Inside. tell you something. I like your style. I know somebody very much who, who believes exactly what you just said, and that is is that she wants her kids to know that she's not throwing anything. Mm -hmm. When you beat her, if you beat her in anything, checkers, a, a trivia quiz, or anything, you legitimately won. She's not giving you anything. So that's what I just heard 
uh, doctor. Listen, Monopoly in my house. Yeah. <laughs> We'll have some folks mad at each other for days, okay? <laughs> They'd be really rough with attitude. And that's the whole, that's the extended family as well. Right. Like, I cannot believe you did that to me. Yeah. So, and there's only one way I know how to make you better. You don't have to be better than me. Oh, I like it. Let's go. So to, that's, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> Let's go to folks quickly, call How are you on with, you're on with Dr. Good? Oh, good afternoon. Hey. Hello. versus diploma. First off, I can't give you a number because we're, not there, we're not there yet. But the state questions you on um, a certain percentage of certificate of attendance. So we are very careful to make sure that our students are earning diploma. Right. Um, there are only certain cases that they can have a certificate of, of attendance for. So that criteria is very small. It is not the track that the majority of our students are on. Right. They are graduating with diploma. Yes. So I don't know where that ugly rumor came from, but we have diploma earning students. Let me say that I, you know, because I've talked about this subject before, and this is just this is just me, you know, out of the out of left field, but. You know, I remember uh, maybe about a, a couple of months ago, uh, you all put together a wonderful PSA, and you had my girl to your to your left, who was uh, the narrative of there, as well as um, I believe the truancy uh, gentleman who was on there, and it was about truancy and absenteeism. And so, you know, one of the things that I've been kind of really, you know, really trying to just figure out and scratch my head and wrap my head around, and and, and I've always wanted people to applaud your efforts about how you're going out of your way because I got a, the the ad and the PSA was absolutely beautiful but my stomach would turn every time I played it and it's the reason why is that I I just can't conceive of children who can go for these extended periods of time and not be accountable to their folks you get what I mean like it, I just respect you all's profession so much that I just can't, you know, I can just only imagine what effort it takes for you all, not only to stay on top of the students that are that are right in front of you, that are sitting there with their eyes wide open, ready to learn. Now you got to go out here and deal and find out why these two students aren't, aren't, aren't showing up on a regular basis. And I can imagine it gets frustrating and things like that. But to your point, I mean, I guess the point that I'm making is, is that I've looked and I've seen firsthand the concerted efforts that, you know, that you all go out here to do to make sure kids come to school. And outside of going and kidnapping them in the night, sometimes it's just you can't do everything to go and, and, and guarantee that. And then you've got the state, which comes down on you and kind of judges you at certain times, I believe, unfairly, because they don't necessarily factor in certain things and they just kind of, you know, put a whitewash label on a school or a district or something. I just think that that's horrible. But I just wanted to throw that in there. That's just my opinion. There's definitely a complexity factor. But but I do want folks to know that our guidance counselors at the high school level work really intently yes. um, to make sure that they are, you know, there are three buckets that students need to um, fulfill in order to get a diploma. And those guidance counselors have spreadsheets and can literally go in and look at a child's name and find out, you know, where they are in their process for reaching diploma status. Mm -hmm. So... Um, when you hear them say things like, well, bucket two is not right. fulfilled, then that means service-based learning or work-based or project-based learning has not been completed, but students still have time yes. to make that happen. So I will say that I don't know who's spreading uh, bad information about us, but we are working for diplomas because Absolutely. at the end of the day, that is what is going to be most productive for the student. Right. We want to put somebody out there and just them out into a, a no-win situation. No. So, um, 
I, I do want to stress that diplomas <laughs> are what we're graduating students with now. There are different types of diplomas. Right. You, have the, you know, but at that to that point, a diploma is what they're walking with. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And as you pointed out, like about five or six years ago, Governor Eric came up with a great idea. I love it. It's a two tiered approach or a tier of a, a, a different pathway. In order to go out here, he, you know, because he's also very concerned and, you know, that was kind of his little thing while he's been office of making Indiana, which we are as a state, the greatest place for workforce. And that's why businesses are sniffing around here. So in addition to people who might go to two and four year universities, he wants kids to, and young people to get some skills so they can jump into the workforce immediately. And so, you know, you already know my thoughts, uh, Dr. Good, and that is, is that the one thing that I think, you know, going forward with the you all, the new superintendent, whatever it is, and the new school board, I just, anybody that will listen, I'll tell them, is that I think when it comes down to this new playing field of competition for kids and, and the hearts and minds of parents and, and what Gary Community Schools has to offer, I literally think that this is the only district that can sit there with a straight face and say, you know what, to be honest with you, if we have the involvement of the parents, you put your kids in Gary Community Schools, they don't have any possibility of failing because even those that might not go on to be nuclear scientists or brain surgeons can go right over to the Gary Air Career Center and grab them a vocational degree. But I can guarantee you this, they come through the district by the time they're 18, they're employable. And, and to your point... Um, and they can get a two-year, uh, you know... Uh, associate's degree. Yeah. So to your point, um, this is my first year as chief of schools, but I sat back last semester with guidance counselors and the high school principal and the admin team to look at where students were right. um, as, it, as it relates to diplomas. We um, met in regards to the senior class. We looked at each and every student. Then we set up meetings with parents right. in December to give them a status check. I even attended some of those meetings <laughs> and talked with parents about where our students are and, and make sure that we're prioritizing diploma versus prompt. Right. Thank you. So so it is not lost on us that what our purpose is. We're we want to graduate every student of course. with a diploma. Now there's a minute um percentage or amount of students who even qualify for that right. certificate. So that is very, very small, um, but and there are conditions. But diplomas are what we are pushing because we know that the workforce Thank you. needs students who have a, at least a diploma. Yeah, I at agree. At the very least. But, but then again, we are offering so many options. Thank you. Over here at the Gary Area Career Center that people, I guess it's a secret. I don't know. I was... Talking with someone this morning, I said the Career Center is the best kept secret. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't want it to be a secret. Exactly. It's not a secret. No. Um, we have amazing programs yes. over here. I was just in graphics, and I had challenged the students to decorate my office. <laughs> like, I want like the painting that's up right. in the gym right. at Westside. Right. I want that in my office. Right. Um, I don't know that I can get the 1984 Westside grad to come do the painting in my office, mm -hmm. but I definitely right. have walked through graphic arts and seen amazing talent oh my God, transferred so onto the computer yeah. and paper. Yeah. So I'm like, ooh, can somebody just come help me? Because I don't have that talent. No, listen, I, t I think I told Dr. Razor, I know I told, told Dr. Page before she left, but I, I think you might have been here and I just told you this story. This was like last year. And I was walking down the hallway over at the Career Center, and, you know, this group of girls or whatever kind of stopped me. So I'm kind of turning around. I'm like, okay, what's this all about? And they were like, hey, can you just do us a favor? You're down there at the radio station. I am just thought they were going to ask me some questions. But they were like, no, come here. And I'm like, okay, where is this going? And they said, I want you to look at something. And they told their friend to turn around. And I saw this. Listen, I'm not a guy who hangs out in salons, okay? I don't, I'm not a makeup expert. But let me tell you something. When this young lady turned around, I thought I was looking at the Oscars. They had made this young lady's hair. I mean, the stuff they did with her eyeshadow and her eyelashes. This was not hoochie. This was not anything. This was like state, like, straight like, Amazing. okay, this person won makeup artist of the year in the Oscars type stuff. Amazing. So think of it. And I think these people might have been just juniors. And then I don't even want to tell you about some of the young men who now I always tease them when I see them in the high school, uh, over in the hallways. They got gold clippers with bags because they're the haircut mm -hmm. stars and the barbering stars. 
And you just think about that because uh, I think the, we've had one of the truants officer when we had him on here. He was talking about his background. And you think about these young people who can go to college now and have a job. You can, I mean, you can go over here and now you're the guy that cuts hair or you're the girl who does who does makeup and hair Absolutely. on you know on campus or off campus wherever you live and, and you now you got money in your pocket because you're a small business. Absolutely, <laughs> I think about I went to Purdue West, yeah. and West Lafayette. There were no yeah, um, yeah. African American hairdressers <laughs> readily available. Right. And so it was the, the you know the girl in the dorm that maybe went to the career center that would yeah. hook up your perm. Right. Or you know hook up your haircut. So it's very viable. Those are viable options. And it doesn't have to be, I went to the career center, and so now I can't go to college. Both are quite doable. Yes. They go hand in hand. Yeah. And when you come to the career center, you're already earning dual credits Thank from you. accredited universities to go towards your college credits. Thank so I, I just really want folks to know that this career center is a jewel. Yeah. It's a diamond in the rough. If it wasn't, other people wouldn't be trying to invest and build their own. Come on. They, I mean, come on. Everybody else everybody wants is one putting now. something in. They want to put it into their schools. Yeah. We have a, a we have like a career center university. Thank you. That's what, I t that's what I called it. I say this is a mini campus. And real it quick, is. And real quick to your point, and then we'll get ready to kind of wrap it up. But to your point about the, you know, business and viability I always tell this story, and this just goes to show you how naive I was. But I was in my twenties, and I would, you know, I, I met my first real black entrepreneur, who was about three years older than me. She was a woman. She was a girl, because I was in my, I might have been twenty-four, maybe I was, but I had just moved to Atlanta, and I was going with a friend, and I had been going to this, dropping this friend off at this person, at this person's hair salon. And one day I was just out there on the sidewalk kind of waiting to pick up. And, and so, I, you know, the lady came, the woman came out. As I said, she's just a couple years older than me, and we started talking. Come to find out, listen to this. This young lady, not only did she own the hair salon, that, and I'm talking about this, and she had one in Decatur, mm -hmm. where I lived, one in Fulton County. She had bought the strip malls. Her salons were the anchor business of the, that's how she, that's what she put her thing as the anchor business of the strip mall, and everybody else was her tenant. Like you get what I'm saying? I, yeah. I'm looking at a 27 year old girl. This is blowing my mind up because number one, she's a she's an African American young lady. She's you know is very smart, mm -hmm. and she's doing this with hair, and she's driving around like with strip malls that she owns, and riding around in Beamers. And she had vision. <laughs> it's crazy. She and she vision. explained to me how strip malls work. Absolutely. Yeah. She, she had vision, and she had the uh, wherewithal to go get the knowledge that right. backs up that vision. Yeah. And now her dream has come alive. At 27. At 27. Yeah. Come on. Well, well, That's amazing. That's, That's what we all want. Right, right. For our children. Yeah. For their, for their passion and their dream to just flow right. into success. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I, I, I always appreciate you kind of sharing that with us because I think you're an example, not just obviously to your team, but... You know, I always try to tell you and people to kind of uh, take advantage because, you know, you and I, you've been on this show and you talk about some of your favorite teachers. Chelsea's told me about some teachers that she runs into and keep in contact with her. And I think mm -hmm. these young people don't really realize yeah. that when they get older, they'll sit back and they'll wonder what such and such or Miss, Mr. Such and Such is up to and just how important they were. And so I, th I think the kids should be happy that you walk those halls mm -hmm. that they get to frequent on a regular basis because when, when you're gone and when they're gone, they're going to sit back and be like, Wow, I wonder what Dr. Good's up to. So, to your point, <laughs> yeah. my, I, I do have a favorite teacher who um, works, she's working with our students again. Yeah. I um, just could not fathom her being retired and being at home so during the day. <laughs> and so, you know, shout out to Kathy Rose. Yeah. She's over there helping out at Bailey, at uh, Bailey STEM Academy. She's an interventionist mm -hmm. and doing an amazing job, and I will say that, that I had Miss Rose in second and third grade. Yeah, I, I remember you, you, you told me this, because I was telling you about Miss Winfrey. Yes. Yeah. And so I cried when I left her. Right. Cried, because she was sending me to Banneker. Right. And I thought it was like my, my, my death sentence, because I was shy, and I didn't know people, and I didn't warm up that great, right? So to to all of that. So you were one of those smart kids. Mm -hmm. No, go ahead. But yeah, I, I, and to all of that, I I know what my teacher, one of my favorite teachers, is doing. Right. To, to this day, she is um, 
working with students. Right. Again, right. All I had to do was ask. Mm -hmm. I didn't have to beg. I didn't have to cry. All I had to do was say, hey, my kids need you. How cool do you think that was for her? Because I'll be honest, I used to get a little uneasy when people used to run up on my mother and things like that out at the grocery <laughs> yeah, store yeah. and give her hugs. I'm like, hey, 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 yeah. wait a minute, buddy. But, you know, my mom would have that great smile on yeah. her face and, 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 and all that kind of stuff and have these extended conversations while I'm over here being a little impatient. Like, let's keep it moving. But I imagine that you coming back in your capacity and her knowing that she had you in second and third grade and seeing how it all turned out, how that decision to send you to Banneker worked out, and now you're right back in the fold of things, running stuff. I mean, so she is, um, she is excited. She, she's always there. She's watched me grow. Right. And I've had a chance to watch her kids grow. And I actually got a chance too. to teach one of them. So this is, it's so exciting for me. But she always reminds me how. Um, happy my mom would be. Oh my goodness. Whatever yeah. yeah. I've become. So, right. So in this moment, I need her. Right. So just continue to give me that push. And that's why I say it's the village. Yeah. Um, students that I've had, they, they don't let go of me. Oh. They still come back for me. Because you like to play or, and hang with them. I saw you I over at the it. STEAM thing that we had over at the Career Center. Remember that? And you were doing the game show whole stuff? Yeah. Now, I'm yeah. patterning myself after you for Saturday, by the way. I love it. So, so, for, so for me, it's about um, yeah, yeah, it's that time. Yeah, it's it's just about creating that that family, yeah. that family culture of passing on that legacy, that baton. And I feel like I got it from some great educators, and I just want to give it to mm -hmm. another um, whoever's worthy. Of course, don't just give it. Make sure that they're worthy. Yeah, you're, yeah, you're right, and I. But I just feel like they're all. They all just need a piece yes. of us. Yeah, the, the piece that they would would get nowhere else. I agree. But right here at Garrett Community School Corporation. Good stuff, Doctor. Good as always. Uh, we wish you well. I want to say shout out to CL. Thank you, Chuck. Oh, go I, ahead. I one more thing. I know you got Chuck reminded me that I I need to. I want to give a shout out to um, Pastor Chet Johnson. Oh, and look. Troy Hawkins. Oh, yeah. So they sure. came over to do a, we, we created a uh, program called Reach 365. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it, it's really about inspiring our young men. Right. Um, making sure they understand their worth mm -hmm. and their value and inspiring them to reach higher and read. So, LaTroy and I went to school together. Right. And Chelsea. LaTroy, I, Ch me and Chelsea, we all went to school together. Mm -hmm. And, um, Troy was looking to give back. He's always here. He's always He's here. here at McCullough at least once or twice a month. Right. But he wanted to do something on a larger scale. And um, Chet was kind of just hanging in the winds, wanting to do something as well. Yeah. And we brought them all together with our principal, high school principal, Carl Scott, and um, our truancy officer, Austin Cook, right. yeah. to talk about getting our boys grounded, our young males yeah. grounded, yeah. third through eighth grade. They really were inspired by LaTroy's message. Mm -hmm. Um and, and I think it was somebody he is relatable. Of course they he they could connect the best set of men in MLB history by the way. Mm -hmm. Somebody was blessed with a left hand. Mm -hmm. He was temporarily a cup so I loved him more but I you know I'm there's no bigger LaTroy Hawkins guy because baseball is my favorite sport so I was following he's a he's a little behind me but once he got picked up uh, by the, and went to the farm team of the twins mm -hmm. uh, you I, I know everything he's ever done. Funny wow. how that we were in high school together, yeah. and um, I always say how he teased me. Oh. I didn't know he played baseball at the time. See. I was a cheerleader. He played basketball. Right, right. right. You didn't know about that baseball Did side of him? Know. Yeah, exactly. that's the one that kind of got him a little famous. Exactly. So we should back <laughs> just for a little, little while, just, just a little, little bit in high school. Just and he was like, um, "I play baseball. That's my real sport." Yeah. And I was like, "You're the little geek. Get whatever. out of here. Exactly. <laughs> right. Where, how's that gonna go for so, you?" So when, once we got to be grown, my husband played baseball, so he was a big baseball fan. He and Troy were good friends. Right. And so Troy's like, yeah, bring your wife to a baseball game so she can see that I play baseball. Nice, so, nice. Good. Yeah. Now, now that's a good story. Shout out to to Pastor Chet, though, because we missed him Sunday. I was here working, and he's part of my Sunday morning crew, the Sunday school hour. I heard he was weightlifting and pulled a little something. Of course, the other pastors uh, want to let him know to not keep doing that. 
But, Secretly, uh, <laughs> I'm, we're putting Pastor Chat to uh, work, so you'll see him on the West Side campus yeah. every now and then. Yeah, I liked his cowboy boots, by the way. Mm -hmm. He was really sporting them. That's my dude. All right, ladies, uh, once again, it's been a pleasure, really. It's always fun when you drop by us there. I really do mean that, and thank, uh, thank you, you Chelsea, too. as always. We're going to get ready to turn it over. Big Pop is probably out there waiting in the wings. Body rolling afternoons coming up next. He's going to take you all the way to about 5 o'clock. Uncle Buck's in the house for some oldies but goodies. And then after that, we turn it over to overnight programming. And, of course, that great inspirational programming that we in the Smith household wake up to every single morning, especially on the weekends. And then, as always, Monday through Friday, yours truly starting at 7.30 in the morning, knocks it all off the rails. All that good stuff just goes right to pieces. Wake up, G.I. with Jeffrey Smith. Until then, go out, do some stuff, be important. More importantly, if you want to, mask up. We're out of here.